Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. <laughs> you know, whenever I, um, people come to do the book reviews, I'm always saying, oh, these people, thank them for coming because they're very busy, but these guys are really busy people. They're, they do five plays a year, I think. They have programs for kids, teenagers, seniors. They do um, the CBA play every year. They do a Santa play. They, I'm probably forgetting some things. They are they, in the process of hoping to get a grant to do um, bringing the arts to people with disabilities. So they got a lot going on over there. They're so busy that Jim couldn't even come. <laughs> so Tony's here to um, review the book, the play that changed my life, and I'm sure he'll tell us about the play that probably changed his. So here's Tony Rivera of the Cohoes Music Hall. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to see some friendly faces out there. Um, you probably see Jim and myself in front of uh, the audience uh, before every performance. And uh, we've tried to um, make uh, our stay at the Cahoes Musical. Um, it's a professional theater, but it's for the community. So we don't really want to title ourselves as a community theater because we bring in professionals from all over the country for our productions. But we really wanted to stay in touch with everyone in, in, in our community and get a lot of their feedback. Uh, and I ask this question all the time of what is your favorite play? What is the play that changed your life? Or what is a person or situation that um, perhaps inspired you to either come to the theater or for those that work with us, inspire them to work in the theater? So when this um, opportunity uh, came to me, I, I, I had to say yes. Um, and the fact that I don't get to read as much as I would like um, outside of grants or sponsorship packages or contracts, um, uh, when it came to um, reading something about the, the career, the art form that I'm a part of, I, uh, I was very, very excited to do that. Um, and a book like this, The Play That Changed My Life, is uh, an incredible insight on various um, playwrights um, what inspired them, the people that inspired them uh, to do what they do. And if you have an opportunity, I really uh, suggest you pick it up. It's an easy read in the sense that um, there, it's a book for, uh, formatted with essays. Um, and so it's, it's a wonderful three, four, five page insight into that one person's life and what um, nurtured their careers. Um, and it's made me look deeper into that particular playwright or uh, their lives. Um, but I think I should start with um, letting you know a little bit about the play that changed my life. Um, and you're talking to somebody who didn't really see their first play or musical until I was 22 years old. Um, we um, I should go back a little bit further and let you know that uh, although I was born in New York, in Manhattan, I lived in Brazil until I was six years old. Um, and so I came to understand entertainment in a very different form. Um, and that's a little bit of what um, I have to fast forward to, uh, what was this gentleman's name? Um, to David Auburn, and he talked about um, uh, the, the House of Blue Leaves. Um, and it was more about the situation where he was from uh, that inspired him. But let me go back to Brazil really quick. I don't know if you know much about Brazilians, but we love to sing, dance, and drink um, and eat. Um, and so anytime there was a family gathering, we, had, we did all of those. <laughs> um, and so we had a lot of entertainment in all of our gatherings. And I remember first moving to the States and um, trying to learn the language, the English language, and figure out um, uh, how to communicate with my classmates in the playground when we had some time. Um, and I realized that I didn't have the verbal skills at the time, but I did have the physical 
And so everyone in second grade at Christ the King Elementary School knew how to samba, uh, because that's how I communicated was through dance. And little did I know that you know the boys were sambaing on this side and the girls, and we put them all together. Next thing you know, I was choreographing um, a, a, during um, uh, our lunch period. Um, Unbeknownst to me, that was a performance, but I never considered myself a performer. Um, I do remember ha having some wonderful memories of um, learning English in the kitchen with my mom, and she was cooking. And I always equate dance now with uh, my sense of smell and food. Um, whenever there was a little bit of an extra spicy dinner, there was a lot of samba going on. Whenever it was a little bit more of a um, tempered, kind of relaxed um, dish, we were doing a little bit more of the slower dances and things like that. And it kept me occupied, but it kept me connected uh, to one, my heritage, and, 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 and two, working on our, our, our language um, in the kitchen. I later went on to, um, to study at the University of Arkansas. Um, I obviously did learn to speak a little bit of English and um, decided to uh, travel to uh, really get to see and, and experience my, my country. Um, and so I decided to attend uh, a school 2,000 miles away from New Jersey where I grew up. So um, here I was in Arkansas on an athletic scholarship. I was a cheerleader and a gymnast. And it was my uh, senior year where our gymnastic our coach, gymnastics coach, came in and said, uh, here's some straws. We need a gymnast to tumble across the floor. They're doing this show with guys and girls and dolls and, okay. And so we pulled our straws and I got the shortest straw. And so I had to show up to a rehearsal. And I got there not knowing what I was gonna get into. Everyone was wearing black clothing and they were looking really weird and doing these exercises with their voices. and. I thought, what am I into? Okay, so I did it. Um, I tumbled across the floor, and the uh, choreographer says, wow, great, can you spin around? So I spun, he goes, that's a triple. I said, a triple what? He goes, that's a triple, triple turn. Good, good, can you jump? Sure, I can jump, so I did a jump. Do a jump and then turn. So I jumped and turned, he goes, you're a dancer. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> No, I don't know anything about dancing. I don't, you know, you know. And he goes, well, what is your, 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 what's your background? Where are you from? So I told him I was Brazilian. And so he loves samba. He put on some music. He goes, dance the samba for me. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so weird. Okay, great. So I did. He goes, you're the dance captain for this next musical. <laughs> So I went on, we did Guys and Dolls. I had an incredible experience. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, there is that fanfare of the audience and you're bit by the bug and all of that. And, um, but I, I wasn't, it was my senior year. I was studying international business and economics. There's no way I was going to be an actor. I wanted to work on Wall Street, not Broadway. So, um, uh, a friend of mine actually kidnapped me and took me to Savannah, Georgia for auditions called SETC's, Southeastern Theater Conference. And um, so I went, I auditioned. Uh, you auditioned in front of hundreds of theaters at the same time. And then you spend the next three days going to different hotel uh, rooms and um, auditioning for specific theaters that were interested in you. Little did I know that I was offered a few, few jobs. And so instead of going to France for a year after graduating, I decided to travel the country as an actor. And I was very fortunate to work in some wonderful theaters, uh, wonderful regional theaters. And it wasn't until um, um, I, the, I, I did uh, Guys and Dolls, and after that, there was a touring company that came through. Um, and they were doing a production of West Side Story. And I thought to myself, this is a really interesting show. Great, good. There's Latinos I can connect with. There's uh, they're all first generation Americans. I definitely could connect to that. Uh, the dancing and the music, of course. But then it was the story. Then it was the, the vocabulary that Arthur Lawrence created for that one particular show um, that really captivated me. The, the fact that 
the Puerto Ricans spoke better English than the Americans, and that piece was very, very interesting to me. And of course, the melding of, 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 of bringing the dance through the music, the dance to tell the story, uh, was e extremely just overwhelming uh, for me. And, and it was probably the first time that I really experienced a uh, over sensory type of an experience where it was audible, it was visual. I, I was sitting in the audience smelling my mother cooking at that time and seeing all of the dance and I thought, wow, this theater thing is kind of cool. This is really neat. Yeah. Um, and so I put that in my back pocket and I thought, okay, that's a, that's a play I'd like to explore some other time. And I went uh, and I, I decided that for a year I would be a performer and then I would you know, land the job at the UN and perhaps be the ambassador to France. Because <laughs> that was the goal. <laughs> Little did I know that um, uh, that same company that was touring West Side Story was in New York the same week that I was and was auditioning for their new uh, tour of West Side Story in Europe. I had to do it. I had to audition. I had to go there. I have. I. I really didn't have much of a resume. I have probably had three professional jobs under my belt. I have an international business degree, um, and I was competing with these actors who've been doing this for years and years. And so there's a card, and you write your name, your height, hair color, eye color, and then you, you jot down a little bit about what your resume may entail. I really didn't have much. So in big letters, I wrote actor slash dancer. Well, the choreographer saw that, and the director saw that, and said, I really want to speak to you a little bit more, and I want to hear about your life. So sure I did, so I just talked to him a little bit about my life, and he goes, thank you for not putting on any airs or pretending to be something that you're not, and thank you for just being a person. You got the job. I was like, what? What am I? What? Okay, great, what does that mean? It means you're gonna to go to Milan and you're going to be one of the first American companies to perform West Side Story at La Scala Opera House. I said, great. La Scala. So I called my voice teacher and said, I got a job at La Scala Opera House. Where is that? What does that mean? And he hung up the phone. He goes, and they called back and said, you have no idea what you're doing, do you? I said, no, I don't. It's, it's, it's in Italy. Isn't that cool? So it was West Side Story. We rehearsed it for four weeks uh, in Slovenia and then performed it for another six weeks in Milan. And Arthur Lawrence came to our um, uh, our preview performance in Milan, and that was that was an overwhelming experience. Again, speaking to the person who created this, um, um, Stephen Sondheim was not available, and um, Bernstein, of course, was not available. Uh, but we performed it to um, a 64-piece orchestra, and uh, Arthur Lawrence was there to give us notes, and um, and and that was one of the most visceral incredibly uh, overwhelming experiences that uh, looking up in, an in a theater where there are six tiers of, of audience members was incredible. And, um, and it all started um, at the University of Arkansas. And it was a teacher of mine that said, this is what you should do. Do you feel that here? And I said, kind of. I, I feel really scared. She goes, then that's why you should do it. Um, and David Auburn uh, also started, um, and he's one of the, uh, the playwrights that we, you can read about in this book. He too had his start. Um, uh, he saw his first show in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, his family was moving from all, all, all around the country, and he settled there to see, um, uh, and started working in different theaters, and Arkansas Rep being one of the theaters which is still in existence, and some other theaters uh, in the area. And he saw a, a play called uh, The House of Blue Leaves, and um, uh, he, he actually didn't see it performed there live, but he, he just learned how to uh, record his VCR and get the timer to, because it was playing on PBS, and he went home and saw the VHS tape and started to understand what the process of theater was for him. Um, and I think that's what I, got, I gathered a lot about all of these authors in, in this book, is when they finally started to realize the process. And I think that's something that I learned too about uh, playwriting, because I've dabbled a little bit in that, but I don't have the courage to really present that to anyone. My dog loves everything I write. My one acts are his favorites, but I, I think that, um, uh, 
when they all figured out their process or found a mentor or a program that they really could connect with in a collegiate setting, um, they understood that. Because there is certainly a process to theater. There is, and that's the part of the, the process, uh, the part of theater that I really in, personally enjoy. Um, as a managing director, I spend most of my time writing the grants, finding the sponsors, um, uh, dealing with the production team and keeping the budgets and things in order. My, our artistic director obviously does a little bit more than that, but I do dabble in the directing and the choreographing, and I am a little bit of a frustrated performer at times. Um, but uh, it's the process. It's the process of taking a, a, a scenic designer's idea uh, from a napkin, perhaps at a cocktail table or just in meeting, and then four months later, it's a full-blown scenic element on stage, or the costume designer's sketch, crazy sketch that they send you, uh, becomes this extravagant sequent gown that your, your starlet wears. Um, seeing the rehearsal, we only rehearse shows two and a half weeks at the Cohoes Music Hall, and it's incredible what these performers can do in such a short amount of time. Um, but day one, everyone in that room when we're introducing ourselves is incredibly scared, intimidated, completely insecure, and then two and a half weeks later, you'd never know it. You'd never know the hundreds of hours that went into something like that. And that's what I love is the process. I love the ability to work. To, I always believe the end product will be phenomenal. I do. I believe that the end product is exactly what the audience will hope, uh, hopefully will enjoy. And some people don't care about those hundreds of hours that go into it. They just want the end product to, to really, to, and that's fine. You see two and a half hours. I live through the hundreds of hours that goes into that, and I really, really, really appreciate that um, and admire it, too. I really do. Um, and that's like something that I gained from a lot of these playwrights in this, in this book here, that um, they all have different, different um, uh, ideas of how they begin their process. Uh, they all obviously have different mentors or inspirations and angels in their lives. Um, I look at... Uh, Oh, this, this gentleman here, Nilo Cruz, um, who is a, a Cuban uh, playwright. Um, and he talks about, too, that he, couldn't, he didn't remember seeing theater in Cuba, but he does remember being exposed to the world of entertainment. Um, when he was a child of eight and nine, they would um, summer in the beaches, and he would think that the shows that he would see were more than magical. He said it was astounding, intoxicating, and imagine being a little boy and exposed to this energy and powerful music and all the colorful images coming from the stage, including lots of the flesh from the showgirls. That was definitely an inspiration for him. Um, um, a lot of them did start with um, their childhood and what were the shows, the stories, um, that inspired them. Um, a lot of them being a little bit older remember listening to the plays on the radio and feeling uh, that the pictures that they could paint in their minds with just getting those words from the radio, they already started writing their own pieces. And they were all really inspired to go see a show, listen to a piece, listen to a show, and then get their friends together or their brothers and sisters or cousins and put on their, 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 their plays themselves. And I think we might, we can all maybe remember that, that imagination um, uh, that when we were children, how it was so easy to play pretend. Um, and it's funny how reading this book really inspired me to think of those times and go, I remember that. I remember dressing my sister up as, as the sheep or, or she had an idea and you know, she needed another you know, girl in her cast and so I had to put on you know, mom's dress or something. You know? And it was, it was a wonderful, it, it made me um, connect uh, to those memories and really um, uh, actually even get on the phone and call sisters or, or mom and say, what are you cooking tonight? Because I really want to dance. <laughs> um, uh, I, I was able to read a little bit more about what inspired some of my favorite playwrights, like Christopher Durang, um, and, and seeing what he wrote um, uh, um, and what inspired him uh, that changed his life, and hearing that it was a musical that really changed his life, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, uh, is a phenomenal play, but uh, in Oklahoma, 
that his mother would, would drag him to, and now he loves that play, uh, that, that, uh, that piece. Um, also reading about a little bit of what, um, what inspired some of these uh, playwrights to go from a play to a musical or a musical to a play. Um, and how foreign sometimes it was for them when uh, all their lives their parents just loved to see musicals and they didn't experience a play themselves until they were a little bit older in age. And how sometimes that was a little bit more moving than the music. Um, I think uh, I listened to uh, David Henry Huang, who was a, um, an Asian playwright who wrote M. Butterfly. And, um, um, Equius was the play that changed his life. Um, and he wrote, um, um, it was a Peter Schaefer, it is a Peter Schaefer play. Equius does not set out to debunk religious faith. On the contrary, it questions the rationalism of contemporary society as embodied in the role of the humanistic priests known as psychiatrists in our dismal of religious ecstasy. Nevertheless, Schaefer's confrontation of my core issues, the verve in which he posed his questions and his imagination variations on biblical stories and text, this excited my imagination, my emotions, and perhaps even my soul. Um, he didn't want to press too much on what the religious um, um, comparisons might have been in that play, but it made him think. It made him really, really analyze uh, what he was seeing and he was doing. I got it. I also was had the opportunity to see Equus um, that was just on Broadway with uh, uh, Daniel Radcliffe, um, Henry Potter, Harry Potter, uh, and uh, what a moving, moving um, play. Um, I don't think I really understood it until after reading it three other times after seeing it. To be completely honest with you, because it was such a psychological. Um, challenge, and it was it, it, it made me ask the question, why? And I think that's what theater does to people. I think that's what um, theater does to a, did to a lot of these playwrights. Um, and I wish I could count how many times in this book they say, why? Why did they write this? Why did I do this? Why? And I think that's what we in theater always like to pose is that question, you know, simply why? Um, and that's what makes us a little different from all the other mammals on this planet, is because we have the conscious to do that. Um, I think uh, Susan, Susan Laurie Parks um, is another playwright here. And it was interesting. I, I would have loved to have been on the other side. This was definitely an interview more than her essay here. And that's what this book is uh, laced with, too. Not just their essays that they submitted um, for publication, but um, the uh, Ben Hodge, who um, also wrote the, uh, the introduction to the book, actually was on the phone interviewing some of these, these playwrights. And it was uh, if listening to Susan Laurie Parks, I would have it seemed like she was a tough nut to crack uh, because she, she kept saying that I don't think there was one instance or one person or one play that really changed my life for a while. But she did write, which really is inspiring to me. And I think uh, we can all learn something from this. Um, she said, so let's say that maybe the special event doesn't exist. Maybe every event, maybe every person is special. Maybe you don't have to go into Harvard to become a success. Maybe the guru is in you. There are a lot of up and coming writers these days who believe that they have to get into a certain school or study with a certain writer to become a success or to be considered a real writer. When writers believe this, they place an expectation on the institution or teacher or external system. And we all know there's a lot of letdown that happens after graduation. Just yesterday on the street, a young man came up to me and thanked me for my work and told me that he wouldn't have become a writer if, he hadn't, if it hadn't been for me. I acknowledged his thanks and then I looked at him in the eye and told him that I believe he's completely incorrect, that he would have become a writer with or without me. I wanted him to know that he would have done it. An oak is an oak is an oak. A redwood will always be a redwood. You will, you will yourself. 
I acknowledge the challenges of people uh, that is very difficult in different circumstances. And now speaking to those of us in the middle ground, I want to encourage artists to realize that while teachers, classes, and events can help you, you should not expect them to make you. Nor, of course, should the teacher believe that she is making the student. But that's a whole other conversation, she says. And I think that's true. I think it's very true that um, uh, we all find the inspiration in ourselves. And I think um, um, some of these writers uh, did have the people to speak with, did have the mentors to, to gain some knowledge from, um, did use their environment to help inspire them. But um, I think what she had to say here about finding the guru in you, finding the writer, finding the inspiration, definitely lies uh, within, within all of us. Um, and it's something that doesn't happen at a young age. I think it can happen at any age. It can happen at any time. I'm constantly inspired. I'm constantly, um, there are constant angels in my life that uh, inspire me. Um, and sometimes it's a positive thing, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's somebody in your lobby going, that show was really awful. <laughs> wow, okay. But that opens up a dialogue to understand why they thought it was awful or, 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 or what can we do better? Or perhaps that wasn't your cup of tea. Um, um, so I really, I really uh, uh, encourage all of you to, to read a little bit more about this, uh, read this book and see what these plays, because some of these plays are, are plays that you might have some really wonderful memories um, uh, in seeing years ago or seeing in different locations too. Um, it's funny how some plays come back into your life. Again, going back to West Side Story, after performing it in Europe for a long time, I had the privilege of, of producing it at the Cahos Music Hall. And it was the, the uh, opening production in our second season uh, at the Music Hall. And I played Bernardo, and um, a role I never played before until I was on, on our stage and had a completely different insight, completely different take with it. I worked with a director who worked with Jerome Robbins um, years ago and having his insight. But what it meant for me that time was that I was actually living the American dream. And it was phenomenal to, under to, to see that and to, to, to understand that. Here's this Brazilian boy who used to samba in the kitchen with his mom while she was cooking. And now I'm producing and creating art and helping to revitalize a community with art um, and was on stage performing this, this, this show that kept on coming into my life, always reminding me of where I came from, what I'm doing, and what my dreams and aspirations were, are. So, it was, uh, so it's interesting. Um, Into the Woods is another play that really inspired me. And years ago, uh, it was our first show ever at the Cahos Music Hall. And Siena College uh, Theater Department was um, uh, instrumental in that. Our costume designer was a resident um, teacher there. All of our scenery, we did not have a scene shop. Our scenery was built uh, at the Siena um, shop. And their students used it as a project. And they came in. Um, and um, erected the set and ran all of our crew uh, for the show. And here, we, here I am seven years later and I had the opportunity to direct uh, that show at Siena last fall. And it was an incredible experience learning, using what I learned years ago and now, and it was completely full circle. Um, and again, theater was the vessel for that. Um, I'm curious, what are, what are the plays or uh, playwrights, events, maybe, that inspired you? I have a question, John. Sure. Can you tell us how the transition between West Side Story and the Cahos Theater came about? Sure. Um, as exciting as it may be, thinking of working uh, all over the world and traveling, after West Side Story in Italy, I, uh, I decided to work on a uh, cruise ship. And so I traveled all over the, country, or the world uh, on a cruise ship. Um, and find myself, when you are trapped on, you basically are trapped on a ship, it's a floating city. You're not allowed, obviously we can't stay in Bora Bora if we'd wanted to, we have to get back on the boat. And we only had four performances a week. I was a singer dancer on the show. And I became a little stir crazy. And so I decided to take all these other jobs while I was there. There was an auctioneer on board. And when people were bidding, he needed somebody to tally. 
oh, using those accounting skills I used, I learned in college. Good, good. Mom would be proud. So I did that. There was a, actually there was a library uh, on on the ship that was completely disheveled and needed organization. Oh, the Dewey Decimal System kicked in. So I, I did that. Um, uh, there were some people working in excursions, and so the scuba master needed some help and the skydiver. So I, I was able to become certified as a scuba diver and also skydive when, whenever. So I learned that there were all these other talents and things that I could do. When we decided to, when I got back to New York, I was a little tired of the traveling. Um, I wanted to settle down a little bit. And I promised myself, because this is years after I graduated college, I promised myself that I would never be a waiter. I would never wait tables. That's not what I consider to be a survival job. I have a degree and I wanted to utilize those skills. I do not want to offend anyone that is a waiter and working in the entertainment business because there are a lot of them. Um, um, but I, I, I had skills that I wanted to use and I wanted to stay in our uh, business. And so what I did is I utilized those business skills and worked with casting directors, worked with producers, worked with directors, kept myself in the loop uh, on, in the theater scene, um, found myself to be in the right place at the right time. I was a hand model for a couple of shots and only because I was delivering a package to a casting agent um, uh, and as I was delivering the package, the receptionist was, her, the phone was going crazy and she's like, I can't find a Latino actor in 10 minutes. How am I gonna find a Latino actor? And I hand her, she goes, can you sign for this? And I'm signing and she looks at my hand, she goes. <laughs> and she gave me $25 and she said, there's a, um, uh, Filipino, Vietnamese um, manicurist around the corner. I want you to go get a manicure and come back. And I did a, uh, I was a hand model for a, a print ad in the Spanish newspaper. It was for Suave low Hand Lotion. And I'm handing somebody, you know, a piece of paper and there's my manicured hands. <laughs> And I was at the right place at the right time. And you know, $425 later, you know, with a manicure, I was, I, you know, so it was, it was a really, um, that just let me know that I was doing the right thing. Um, but I, the more I worked in the marketing, advertising part of theater, um, I was gaining the process of theater. I was in on those meetings um, when they were thinking of producing plays or coming up with that, that new play that even back then people were talking about hairspray. And that was sort of the, the, the phase of when Broadway was taking movies and transforming them into, um, into musicals or full-blown plays. And so I was on the cusp of seeing how all of that was working. And so that made me really think, I don't want to perform. I want to be part of this. I want to be part of the building block aspect of theater. And there's this wonderful organization called the Actors Fund of America. And they, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a fund that was founded, whew, I think it was in the 50s, um, to help performers, especially when they were um, transitioning um, transitioning in their lives from because of age they perhaps were not performing anymore and so they needed a little bit more assistance uh, with skills to build um, to get out into the professional world and do things without entertainment so it's a it's an organization that helps uh, all all professionals um, they have different homes uh, one in Chicago a few in New York and some in Los Angeles so I was the marketing and advertising specialist for them and I worked with the Broadway companies if you all, you, obviously you've been to a Broadway show, um, they have special performances. And on Monday nights, usually when it's dark, every Broadway show has an Actors Fund performance. And that means that all of the actors, the crew members, anyone affiliated with the show performs for free. And the Actors Fund sells those tickets for that special event. And all of that money raised goes to the act Actors Fund and what um, all of their programming. That was, what, that was my child, that's what I did. I worked with all of the Broadway shows. We advertised, sold tickets to, to that performance and all of that money went to the fund. And I loved, loved, loved it. And um, I met a gentleman by the name of Jim Charles who grew up in the city of Cohoes, New York, which I had to look up on the map and see where that was. And um, summer of, uh, we actually, we were, 
oh, I should go back and say, I, I did work um, September through mm, June and then talk my bo boss into giving me July off because I had to go perform. Um, so I would do some summer stock shows. And Jim and I met at the Westport, uh, in Westport, New York, at the Depot Theater doing a show there. And he said, you know, we're driving back to New York after the contract. He goes, I want to stop in Cahoes and show you this gorgeous theater. And I thought, OK, sure, let's do it. Walked in, saw this gorgeous, magnificent gem that was completely unused, and uh, quickly went back to the Actors Fund and spoke to the president and said, this is going to sound really weird, but I think I want your job just in Cahoes, New York. So I need your advice. Um, and he was, he was wonderful in, in trying to uh, uh, instruct me in, in how to start a business, start a theater arts organization. Um, and I took all those skills, all those, that international business degree, um, working in, uh, at the Actors Fund for three and a half years, and a few years before that, working in the industry in New York and seeing how productions were built and how things happened. And here I am. Here I am. Yeah. So it was, it's interesting, again, how um, I think it, it being theater found me and led me uh, to do what I'm doing now. It's something that I certainly didn't you know, start off thinking, I'm going to be a producer when I grow up. Mm -mm. Again, it was going to be the UN working as an ambassador to France. <laughs> Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. But you still like to perform. You know, I do. I, I do. I, Unfortunately, um, I don't have the concentration uh, as I did when I was younger uh, because, I, because of the m multiple hats I have to wear at, at the music hall. I, um, if a light is at the wrong cue, it comes up too early or too late and I'm on stage, I'm thinking, oh, that light is there. Or if double A, three, and four aren't sat, I know that I sent Dorothy those tickets. Why isn't she here? I could have resold those tickets. There's nobody sitting there. That is $60 we're out of. All of this in the middle of a song, you know? <laughs> so I have a hard time putting on the blinders um, now. Uh, my partner, Jim Charles, loves it. He's great. He finds the escape in, 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 in that. Um, so it's, there are a few shows that I, uh, I'd like to do, um, but um, the concentration level isn't there as, as it used to be. Uh, I think it's put on pressure that I do to myself. You know, once the curtain goes up, I can't help if Dorothy's not there in her seat. You know, I should just enjoy the process and the show. But the directing aspect of what I, uh, at the theater, I'm really, really enjoying that. I enjoy that process. I enjoy the team aspect of it. And, and theater definitely is a team sport. It really, really is. <laughs> it definitely is. But um, I think you'll see me on stage, um, not next season, but the season after that. Because with the mistake I did, uh, we did, and that's one of the pieces of advice that Joe um, Tavila from the Actors Fund gave me. He says, if you ever put yourself on stage, your audience will always want you to be on stage. I said, no, they won't. They're like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And so the question is, when are we going to see you on stage next? We just saw Jim shave his head on Sweeney Todd and kill people. And he was just doing this. And when are we going to? And, and, you know, and I, I did it to myself. And we used to switch. We should flip flop. One season he's in a show. One season I'm in the show. I haven't been in a show in about four years. <laughs> yes? Unfortunately, I missed the very beginning. I didn't get to hear. If you've been back to Brazil, if you still have relatives in Brazil. Oh, I have been. Uh, actually, I was just there two summers ago. I, um, I'm a, a member of Rotary International, and they have a group study exchange program. And, I, and they needed a translator and someone to go to Brazil for four, four and a half weeks. And I was there to uh, visit an entirely different part of Brazil that I wasn't familiar with um, and stayed with my family for a little bit and saw them. But the majority of my family is still in Brazil. After um, me going to college, my family moved to Florida. And when my two other sisters graduated and went on with their lives, my parents were spending um, it was more like eight months in Brazil and, and the rest of the year in the States visiting with us. Um, but um, I do get there often. I speak to them all the time, especially now with the World Cup going on. Um, <laughs> we speak a lot more. Um, and it's, uh, 
it's another goal of ours, um, and this is within our next five years, is to actually take a production uh, to Brazil. Uh, take something that we uh, produce here in the States and tour it to three different venues uh, in the country of Brazil, because uh, they love Americana. Greece is a huge hit in Brazil. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Beauty and the Beast is another really wonderful play. Um, and Tommy, they really enjoy Tommy there. So anything Americana, they really enjoy. Cats. Cats is another one that they wanted us to do. Yeah. Um, what do, you, what do you think about this phenomenon? I um, honestly just saw my first episode about three weeks ago because everyone in our kids' group was telling, have you seen it? Do you know what you're doing? I want to do the song from Glee. I want to know. So I don't, all right, let me watch Glee. I think it is, if I may say, awesome because I think what it's doing is it's, it's, it's uh, getting the musical out of just the theater and bringing it to, to the chorus, to the glee clubs of the schools, to the teenagers and the youth. Um, so I think there was such a generational gap of, I'm not gonna sing, and, uh, singing and dancing is uh, if I was in dance school or if I was uh, in a theater group. Now I think it's become, because of American Idol, because of a uh, high school musical, um, because of Glee, now it's accessible and it's cool. And I think that's key with a lot of kids now, that it's cool to do that. Um, it, it's cool to, to show your talent, uh, which I think is wonderful with, uh, with, with something like Glee. Um, yeah, I, and now, you know, I can't wait to watch season one and two and to catch up, <laughs> catch up on all of the characters. And it's incredible watching too how it's such a smart business because they have a lot of uh, Broadway performers. Um, they weave them into the show. Um, and so, uh, for example, Adina Menzel plays one of the lead characters' mothers um, and she was in Wicked. And Wicked was a while ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. And she and Kristen Chenoweth, who were, who were also the originals of, in Wicked, are now you know, plotting to be on the show at the same time. And I hear that they're, they're, the two of them are going back to Broadway in a couple of years. So what they're doing is they're getting these hit kids hooked on Glee, hooked on who these two performers are, and then in a couple of years, they're going to be on Broadway. So now they're going to go see a show. So, I mean, I think it's incredible how television is being used as a medium for the musical. And so are the movies, obviously. Uh, Chicago was big in, 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 in bringing that to the, to the big screen. Nine, if you haven't seen that, was a beautiful piece as well on the big screen. So, and I think that's what didn't, that was how it originated, right? That's how we, movies were, were all movie musicals. Um, and so for me, as a producer of musical theater, I think it's great. What you're going to present? Do you have like a board or a group, or is it just you? Well, what we just did this year for the first time is, is have a survey of what people were interested in, uh, and it was interesting seeing a lot of what our audience wanted to see. But normally, the artistic director um, chooses 15 uh, of his choices. I only choose 10 because uh, we need a tiebreaker somewhere, and we do one show a season that is incredibly close to us or something that we've wanted to do for a long time, a story you want to tell, a message we'd like to, to, um, to shout out. Um, and then uh, we, we sort of always start with, uh, we bookend the, the, the year with music, big dance, splashy musicals. Start really, really big and really, really big. Um, Christmas is always a family-friendly event. Um, one, because our, our sponsor loves the shows, loves the family friendly, she wants that sort of environment. We also bus in a lot of um, students from all over the capital region for 9.30 a.m. Um, performances, and so that has to be obviously a, a school youth friendly event. Um, and it's, it, it, you know, it's been sometimes a um, throwing it on a dartboard and seeing which one sticks, or a lot of times we are, uh, you, you see what other theaters are doing in the area, you see what shows are actually available 
uh, for us to, to do um, in the area. We, we, we call Philip Morris over at Proctor's and say, okay, Phil, what are you thinking about doing? So we don't you know, contradict. Uh, we see what a few other theaters are, are doing as well and what has been done in the past. Obviously, we're not going to produce something that somebody just did the year before. Um, so it is a, uh, it's become more and more difficult um, uh, because for me, I look at it with the numbers, you know, how many actors are needed for that show? How many pieces do we need? Uh, what are the costumes that we're looking at? Is it a time specific show um, that we have to build all of these costumes? Can't we just do it in jeans and t-shirts, you know? So I look at the numbers, Jim looks at the artistic impression of things, um, and we've, we've come to a, uh, to a, a really good, I think, um, um, sort of understanding of what our audience is like. We did take a chance a couple of seasons ago and perform, produced two plays. We will never produce another play again. Uh, I don't think it was because the, the, I thought the plays were phenomenal. I thought they were great. Um, but our audiences, they want to see musical theater. They want to see dancing. They want to see positive, happy, uh, and that's what we've been doing, and I think that's what we do really well. So it was a great um, uh, reflection in what it is that we do, what we do really well. Sure, if we had a different uh, venue, if we had a small black box theater, I'd love to do more experimental or new works. Um, but our audiences want musical theater, so that's what we're going to give them. We've also broadened, we used to think two seasons out. We're now thinking five years down the road. Uh, we, we have the next five seasons in our minds planned um, because there are some shows that we want to evolve into other bigger culminating events. And that's also educating and training the audience a little bit. Um, it's a very sophisticated audience. It's a very intelligent audience. But when you see something, uh, you can reflect on what you saw the year before, and that opens your mind for something that you want to see the year, the coming year. Whether it be a new playwright, a new, um, um, a new director that we've introduced into our season, something that they would like to do a few years down the road. Um, it's, uh, it's been really neat thinking of things, not just as season, per season, but now as, as the bigger picture. And something that we want to do with our children's program, too, that we're helping to evolve uh, with them. It's a fun puzzle, but right now, we know exactly what we're doing, well, what we want to do for the next four years. I'm a season ticket mm -hmm. for a number of years, and I love what we do. Thank you. Um, and I don't know enough about musicals, you know, what's going on, you know, what's, what's what's new, and are there like new and upcoming, um, less, you know, big splashy musicals um, that you could do? I mean, that's, you know, something more avant-garde. I don't know if you can say avant-garde sure. musical in the, same, in the same breath, but, you know, it's, it seems, you know, yeah. do you know what I'm I do, I do, and they are, um, and that's what I mean about sort of educating the audience a little bit um, and, and, and teaching them more about the story, that sometimes you can have a musical without dancing. I thought Sweeney Todd, speaking of a little bit avant-garde on the other side, I mean, it's, it's a musical about a serial killer, basically. Um, uh, but audiences loved that. Uh, but we had to sort of introduce them into the darker side of theater a few years ago with maybe a ragtime or maybe Miss Saigon. You know, I mean, this is a show that she ends at the end of the show, she shoots herself. And her child, her four year old child, finds her. You know, so it was seeing what our audience could handle, seeing what they could, who we knew years ago we wanted to do Sweeney Time, but we had to start off with a little bit more of a, a progression to that. Yes, there are a lot of. Um, uh, smaller shows, non-dancing shows, all musicals with a little bit more of a cutting edge, new um, uh, sense and feel to it. We're also at a different, society's a very different place now um, and what we can handle, I think, with the media, what we see on the news, those horrific stories and pictures that are always um, in front of us. I think we've been a little bit desensitized to things, and so I, we can push the envelope a little bit with our audience. I think we can make them think a little bit more. I think we can challenge the darker side of humanity uh, a little bit. Um, but we have to be very, very systematic in how we place those shows. 
uh, in our in our um, season. I don't think our audiences would really enjoy a two-person show right now. Um, there are some wonderful two-person shows with one set and one costume that I would love to do, but we can't do that. Um, not quite yet, not yet. But I think there will be there'll be the time. I want there to be the time when. I want to produce a show where audience is okay with sitting back and just breathing and just listening. The one thing about the plays that um, we resoundingly were hearing about is that our audiences felt disconnected because they weren't able to applaud after every scene or every song. And I thought that to be really an interesting point because they thought um, with a musical, after the number, we applaud and we cheer and we say to the person next to us, that was really great, I love the dancing. And then you go on and the song and you, with a play, you sit and you listen and you watch. And maybe at the end is when you show your appreciation or maybe at the end of act one. And so it was interesting how the participation wasn't there with the plays and it is with the musical. And I found that I, that just really, wrapping my brain around that was so fun to do because now we start thinking, okay, what is the audience really going to be involved with? That they, that they will enjoy. So there are some really wonderful things out there that we are going to do that are new, um, but also new plays in, in understanding the, the licensing and the, the, the copyright. Uh, w when a play is produced, recently produced on Broadway, um, they hold the rights for a long, long time. Um, normally it goes from Broadway, then perhaps a national tour, and then it's open to um, regional theaters like ourselves. We also live, um, we're only, we're less than 250 miles from New York City. And so a lot of times they hold in um, making those rights accessible to regional professional theaters because why would you come to Cohoes, New York when you can drive down to New York to see the show and pay $140 for a ticket? You know, uh, so there's those, uh, uh, we have to think of those restraints too. So a lot of times, obviously the shows that you see are sometimes classics or uh, fairly new uh, that um, are now able for us to, to produce. So many times we, we get, why can't you guys do Phantom of the Opera or Mamma Mia, I love Mamma Mia. We wanna see Mamma Mia. Well, it's not available for us, you know. Um, or sometimes it's available to proctors before it's available to 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 Cahoe's Music Hall. So, um, but no, there are. You, I, I'm so glad that you think of that because I think it's it's giving the audience that one show a season at least one for them to just sit and breathe, and it's okay. Um, it's okay for for you to just listen and and then come up with your own idea of what the story is after the show. Um, a, a huge example of seeing what the audience is, uh, we did 42nd Street a few years ago, and there's this one number, um, the money number, and there's 24 dancers tap dancing their hearts off, dimes rolling on stage, people dancing, dancing, it's an eight minute number. On, it was seven minutes and 42 seconds, we opened up this glitter bag and glitter came falling down. Audience was mental, crazy, screaming, cheering, and I thought, oh my goodness, sparkly things? That's what got you guys to start applauding and going crazy for glitter. Not the 24 dancers who had three costume changes and dancing for seven and a half minutes. So it's interesting what we do. Uh, rain. The rain. rain. You've come a long way, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Much yeah. more sophisticated. Yes, yes. Uh, we also surround ourselves with very intelligent, young, creative um, uh, production team. We're very fortunate that way. And I think it's, it's true. People are now, we, we don't really have to go out too much seeking the resumes. They come to us. Um, it's also working with, you know, we've worked with hundreds of actors and, and dozens of designers, and they tell their friends are now there. So they, uh, yeah, we're, really, we're, we're fortunate that we're only two and a half hours outside of New York as well, because they, they get to flex their creative muscles not too far from home. Um, do you subject any New York State government funding? We do, we do. Um, now, what's this problem down at the State House? Uh, well, it slowed down a lot of our um, funding. Um, when we're notified that you know an assemblyman or senator or somebody has uh, a member item or some money to give to us, we're ecstatic. We're, it's wonderful, and then you go through all the paperwork, and usually a couple of months later you receive your funding. Well, now that the, the budget is uh, frozen, so are all the funds as well. Um, 
for us. So we're waiting on some of that money. The NISCA, the New York State Council on the Arts, has been a phenomenal supporter of what we do at the Cahoes Music Hall, and um, they see that uh, and are helping. Um, parks and recreation have been great as well. We do work in a historic landmark. Um, and we've been able to improve the infrastructure tremendously uh, at the Cahoes Music Hall with a lot of the state funding too, just for the building itself, which is wonderful because the traffic that has come through there in the last eight years is incredible and she needs a little TLC and a little help. And of course, the, uh, the city of Cahoes has been an incredible partner in everything that we do. Uh, we work hand in hand with them to bring people to the city of Cohoes that for a lot of reasons would never really spend much time there, I don't think. Um, you know, it's, it's, the restaurants love it when there's a show going on, so you see the ripple effect. Um, I love, there was one day where uh, we had school buses lined on Remsen Street for a 9.30 a.m. show and a gentleman came into the lobby and said, I'm calling the cops because I can't drive down the street, this is ridiculous. And I just, I said, please call them, please. And tell them that comment, how, you know, we're, we're, we're blocking the street with school buses with 400 screaming kids upstairs in the theater. I think that's a wonderful compliment. Um, I don't think he was very excited about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, it does, it does. And it's, we're not, a lot of organi arts organizations and, and theaters are in the same boat. Um, waiting on, on some of the funding um, from, from the state, which is unfortunate because already from last year, a lot of that budget was already slashed. So the little that we're hoping for means a lot. What was, your, what was your favorite chapter in the book? My? The first play and the play. Uh, on, on this book, it, it really was. Um, uh, what's his name? Nurez. I really could connect with. Um, um, Horton Foote, I think, was a phenom phenomenal um, uh, writer, but uh, Nilo Cruz, I think, was my favorite. People. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the tropics. And in the tropics. Yeah. Did you read the book as well? No. Oh, okay. I saw the play over at uh, Capitol Run. Mm -hmm. Great play. A wonderful theater too, by the way. Uh, Capitol Rep does incredible work. They really, really do. Um, um, Maggie finds some wonderful directors and playwrights, and they do take the chance. I think that's one of the theaters that still takes the chance uh, with new works and um, undiscovered uh, writers. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm constantly inspired by going to see their shows there too. Uh, but that was definitely my favorite um, chapter and one of, one of the playwrights that I want to read more about. And I think that's what the book did for me. Um, there's so many plays now that I really want to read. And I actually was inspired to start a playwriting program with our kids. Um, so I think in the next year or two, you might see a playwriting uh, program at the Cahoes Music Hall because I, I, if this is the process that these, um, uh, these people went through, I would love to share that with our children who I think have so much to say and sometimes can't articulate it or write it down. Um, and so I want to inspire some more playwrights um, to do that. Um, so, so thank you for that opportunity. Thank you.